from the 12th chapter, and we hear these words. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And then from 1 Peter, we hear these words. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each one of you has received. These are the words of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we continue in this stewardship series, looking at our blessings and the ways that we have been blessed by the people of God, I want to ask you all to ponder a question. What would you do if you had no limits or no constraints in your life? Where would you live? What would you do with your time? How would you apply the education that you have received? What would you do with the talents and skills that you have if you had no limits? No limits at all to what you could do. What hobbies would you engage in? How would you spend your money? How would you spend your time? Now, if you've got those things in your mind, I want to ask you another question. Why aren't you doing those things? See, I truly believe that God has given us a great gift in the gift of our passions and our imaginations, our dreams and our aspirations. But so often we squelch those things, believing that we cannot accomplish them. Believing somehow that we don't have time to pursue them, or believing that other people are more gifted and talented than we are. Oh my gosh, how much we would all be cheated if somewhere along the way Anna had felt like she didn't have a voice or the courage and confidence to sing that beautiful solo for us. If somehow she had felt limited and unable to share that beautiful gift with us. See, I believe that there are untapped gifts, untapped treasures in every congregation around this globe because of limits that we put on ourselves, because of our belief that we don't have time or energy or that we're not good enough, that someone else can do things better than us or that we won't succeed in whatever it is that we feel God has placed upon our heart as a passion or a dream or something that we've imagined that we can do. We put limits on ourselves, believing that we are constricted when God calls us to go forth. When I look through the Holy Scriptures, I see that the Scriptures are filled with people that God called forward, and yet they started to say no because they felt limited somehow. You think about Moses when he felt called by God at that burning bush to go to Pharaoh and say, set my people free. The first thing Moses had to say was, no, I can't go. I have a stuttering problem. I can't speak. Person after person in the Holy Scriptures wanted to turn away from what God was calling them to do. But our God is a God of the impossible, right? Our God is a God of resurrection who can bring life out of death. 
So if you feel a passion in your heart or if you dream a dream about someday, I want to encourage you today to tap in to that and not allow a mindset of limits to stop you from following that dream and that passion that I believe God has placed in your heart and in your life. The Old Testament story that I read for us today, that portion in chapter 12, is about Abram and Sarai. We know them more as Abraham and Sarah. And if you remember the story, you remember well that Abram and Sarai are married and that they are elderly and that they have wanted children and they have not been able to have children. And God says to Abraham in his old age, I will bless you with a child. And they don't want to believe it because age has limited them. How many of us end up feeling like age limits us and we can't do certain things because we're too old now or we're too young to try? They believed they were too old. That was their limit. They could not have a child. And God said, I can push you beyond your limits. And they conceived and had a child. And God's promise to Abraham that we read in the passage today says that God will bless Abraham, that his name is blessed, so that others will be blessed. I learned a long time ago to pay attention whenever the Bible says, so that. Those two little words mean so much. They give us the reason for things. The reason for the blessing is so that others could be blessed. And my friends, we are all children of Abraham. We are blessed so that others can be blessed as well just as Abraham was called to go forth and to share that blessing with others we sit here today because he followed and allowed that blessing to spill out and touch others lives and we are called just as Carol so beautifully said to bless future generations with the gifts and the passions and the skills that God has given to each one of us. We are blessed to be a blessing so that others may be blessed. Now, my friends, there's a wonderful thing that I have come to really appreciate a truth that I believe our world needs to hear over and over again. And that truth is this, that scriptures and science are not opposed to one another. This world is a world that God created, and the science of this world helps us to understand the truths of God's creation. And one of those truths that came to me a year or so ago is a truth that I read about in one of Simon Sinek's books. Simon Sinek, of course, is a writer on leadership. He's written books like Leaders Eat Last and Start With Why. Some of y'all have read some of his writings or follow his blogs. But he wrote about oxytocin. Anybody heard of oxytocin? Several of you have. It's a significant, significant hormone that gets released into your body when someone hugs you or when someone you admire and respect gives you a pat on the back and tells you good job. Some call it the love hormone, the feel-good hormone that's released. It actually binds people together when you have that oxytocin relationship. 
It's a hormone that gets amped up and released within you to do some kind thing for someone else. Oxytocin is actually even released by our pets. So when you pet your dog, rub your dog's head, and they kind of roll over, it's because you released oxytocin in them and they've released it in you. And you get that warm feeling inside, like the Peanuts character that said, happiness is a warm puppy. That oxytocin gets released into the world. Well, that science says that when you do something good for someone else, it opens up a door for you to feel good and blessed yourself. Oxytocin happens when we do something kind for someone else. Study after study after study in science says that our health is related and our level of health increases when we do good things for other people. A study from the UK a few years back, they looked at 40 different studies held over a 20 year period that showed something truly amazing to those who were studying it. It showed that the impact of doing something good increases our own health. A lifestyle of selflessness, of volunteering, of helping others reduces our own level of stress, our level of depression, the amount of heart disease we have, and mortality is actually delayed. You can exercise, you can eat right, you can do all of those wonderful things for yourself, but you'll only get healthy to a point if you're only thinking about yourself. Your health and your mortality increases, increases when you help others. Start doing something for someone else and you go to a whole different level of health, they say. And the data from that UK study of 40 other studies conducted over a 20 year period shows something else even more amazing. For those of you who have teenagers in your life, it says that the impact is even more dramatic for teenagers, even if they do good works grudgingly. So yeah, encourage your teenagers. Encourage them to get involved in volunteer ministries. Encourage them to help other people and to do things for others, to have that community spirit to reach out to others and to share in the passions that God has created into them to explore those dreams and to do things to make this world a better place, to reach out and do good in this world. God told Abraham thousands of years ago, I am blessing you to bless others so that others may be blessed by you. And that same truth is one that we need to claim as a congregation and as a people and truly as a nation. For what is true for individuals is true for communities. When we reach out and become a blessing to this community, our community becomes stronger and blessed because of that. And we know that our world needs a blessing right now, a blessing of goodness and strength and peace and love and mercy. You've heard of an inferiority complex before? An inferior, inferiority complex is when someone looks at life and other people through inferiority glasses. You can sing the praises to someone as loud as you want to, deafening sounds of you are great, you are good, you are important. But if they have an inferiority complex, they'll continue to feel inferior. At the other extreme, of course, is a superiority complex, people who have on glasses of superiority. But I wanna encourage us to have a blessing complex. 
to believe so much in the blessings that we have and to be so attuned to the blessings that God has given to us, to those dreams and those aspirations, those gifts and those talents that we have, that everything we touch exudes those blessings and explodes those blessings all around so that others are blessed all around us. And it all starts, I believe, with having a heart, a heart for blessings, a heart for wanting to touch others with blessings. James Moore, a wonderful preacher and writer, tells a story about a man named George. He says that George was in the hospital and his sons came to visit him one day and George had been a top executive working for a major corporation all of his life, and so he knew lots of important people. The president of the hospital realized that George was in his hospital, and he came by his room to visit with him while, while George's sons were there. George talked with him, engaged in conversation with him, and shared a wonderful blessing with him of encouragement, thanking him for being there and being attentive to everything that the president of the hospital shared with him, thanking him for the work that he did in the hospital. The president of the hospital left, and a few moments later, the janitor came into the room to mop the floor and to empty the waste baskets. And George engaged in a conversation with the janitor. He asked him about his life, and he thanked him for the work that he did for the hospital. He thanked him for how spotless the room was and for how hard he knew that he was working in all of the rooms and how difficult it might be. He shared a blessing with that janitor. When the janitor left the room, George's sons looked at him and said, Dad, it's real interesting to us. You treated the janitor with as much grace and kindness and hospitality and interest in his life as you were in your interactions with the president of this hospital. We don't understand. Why did you treat them exactly the same? And George reached in his pocket and he pulled out two items. He pulled out a pocket cross and on that cross it said, God loves you. And he pulled out a marble. And on the marble was engraved the words, do unto others. He looked at his sons and he said, these Remind me of why I'm here and my purpose in life. God has blessed me because God loves me. And God wants me to bless others by doing unto them as I would have them do unto me. These are the two that I live by. Now let me ask you, sons, if the president of this hospital was absent for a week from the hospital and the janitor of this hospital was absent for a week from this hospital, which one do you think the people would miss the most? Don't ever think that what God has called you to is insignificant or that any person is insignificant or that any gift is insignificant. We are all gifted and graced by God to be a blessing to others, and we are called to share those blessings with others and to recognize that gift in others. Starts with a heart, a heart for wanting to bless others and for realizing how we are blessed and how the simplest little things can make a difference in this world. When you receive in the mail what we are calling a ministry menu that lists for you various gifts that God has blessed us with, gifts of creativity, gifts of paying attention to details, gifts of management and administration, gifts of leadership, 
and ways that you can use those gifts, you'll notice on that list some things that might seem insignificant but that are so important. Like simply being a greeter on a Sunday morning, standing in the hallway and saying, good morning, welcome, how are you today? And helping someone find their way to a classroom or to the sanctuary, to the restroom or to a nursery. Think about the people who right now are in our nursery holding babies so that parents can be here in the sanctuary. Something so small, something that takes just a little bit of time and attention. Think about the people who are needed to run the cameras and the sound system today. This church runs on volunteers and the generosity of your finances. If volunteers had not been here today to do this beautiful floral arrangement that Sam put together for us, we'd be without the beauty here today. If our acolyte had not been here to light the candles, if our choir members had not been here to sing, if our sound and audio people had not been here to run this system for us, if our ushers had not been here to pass out the programs to you, and our greeters had not been here to assist people I wouldn't be able to do the things that I'm able to do and we wouldn't be able to enjoy this service and this time together with one another. If Sunday school teachers had not prepared lessons and been in their classrooms ready to serve, children would have gone into empty rooms. We run on volunteers, great acts, of sharing time and talent. Tony Campolo, many of y'all are reading one of his books right now in your Sunday school class, but Tony Campolo, popular speaker and lecturer and evangelist, tells a story about a time he went to a funeral of a man named Kilpatrick. His mother had been after him ever since he was a little boy, telling him that it was always important to go to funeral services of people that you know. You should always go to a funeral or memorial service for someone that you know. It's important for your presence to be there for the family members who are grieving and out of respect to celebrate that person's life. And so he knew this man Kilpatrick, and so he went to his funeral. He arrived at the funeral home, and he went into the chapel, and nobody else was there. He sat down in one of the chairs and waited for the funeral service to start, and nobody came in. So he went up to the front where the open casket was laying in front of that sanctuary chapel, and he looked into the casket, and oh my goodness, it wasn't Kilpatrick. So he started to turn and leave, and right then an elderly woman walked up and took his hand. And she said, you were his friend, weren't you? Tony didn't really know what to say to this woman who looked like it was probably the man's mother or maybe his wife, he wasn't sure, but obviously someone related to him. And he said, yes, I was. He was a good man. Everybody loved him. And the elderly woman just squeezed his hand and said, sit with me. They sat down and a pastor came in, conducted a service, and after the service was over, the woman took Tony's hand again and she said, ride with me to the cemetery. And so he did, he got in the limousine and he rode with her to the cemetery and he stood beside her at the graveside. 
And after words were spoken of scripture and a prayer was given, Tony grabbed one of the flowers just as the elderly lady did, and he laid it on the coffin like she did. And then he took her hand, led her back to the limousine, and they rode back to the chapel. And as they were riding back from the funeral, he looked at the woman and he confessed to her. He said, you know, I want to be your friend, but I can't be your friend unless I tell you the truth. I'm afraid I need to tell you, I never knew your loved one. And the woman seemed to pay no attention at all to what he had to say. Instead, she just patted him on the hand and she said to him, you'll never, ever, ever know how much it has meant to me that you are here with me today. I share that story with you because it's about the power of presence blessing others simply with our presence, noticing that they are there, noticing what their needs are, and being willing to be the person who reaches out with whatever gifts we have to meet their need and to let them know that they are loved, that they are seen, and that they matter. May we have the faith and the heart to have a blessing complex so that we bless others as we have been blessed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.